The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide. Thank you for listening to this show recorded on June 6, 2011 as an interview between Terry Lakin, Marco Cellino, and Dr. Jerome Corsi. Please listen to the show, then visit terrylakin.com and consider supporting Terry for the sacrifice he's made on behalf of the nation. Good afternoon and welcome again to the Terry Lakin Action Radio Show as we restart the show after Terry's return. For those of you who may be listening for the first time to hear Dr. Corsi, you probably know that Lieutenant Colonel Terry Lakin chose to disobey a direct order and invite his own course marshal because he felt very strongly about the eligibility of the Commander-in-Chief. As a result, he went to prison for five months, and he's recently been released. And so we're very pleased now for the first time on the Terry Lakin Action Fun Radio Show to have Terry Lakin himself. Good afternoon, Terry. Well, good afternoon, Marco. Uh, I understand it's uh, pretty nice to not be within 40 feet of everything, correct? It is. I'm just enjoying the, the freedom now. It's uh, you know, Everything is brighter on the other side of the chain link fence. And you've been very, very busy. As we know, I guess a cartoon came out today outlining the huge number of tasks you have to do just to get a medical license. How's that going? Well, it's uh, completed now, just uh, awaiting the mail system and, you know, review, which will take uh, several weeks to several months. But, yeah, that was quite the ordeal. It uh, took me quite a bit longer to get in touch with everybody uh, associated with my past schools and uh, all my transcripts and test scores and all the uh, training programs that I'd been in to, you know, send in their um, direct validation of my my schooling and training. And there were a couple of critical documents that you had to turn in that were notarized. What was the most significant one uh, relative to our discussion? Well, the, I did have to get a notarized copy of my birth certificate and also a notarized copy of the photograph on my uh, passport. So I guess they wanted to be sure that you were really you. Yes, uh, validate that I am a citizen or in the country legally, I guess. <laughs> That's right. And then you've been also working through six months of mail and doing some things with your kids. What's been some of the uh, more interesting things? I know you went on a field trip, ball games, right? Yes, yeah. Um, you know, my, my daughter is very active in, in school and, and gymnastics, and, you know, just uh, getting her to all those programs, uh, she had a field trip where I was a chaperone on and, uh, you know, ran around in the Chesapeake Bay planting marsh grasses uh, with with her and her classmates, and uh, that was just a, a beautiful day out there. Um, several baseball games in practice with my, my son, Andrew, and, you know, he's the uh, youngest one on the team in, in this league, but uh, he's standing in there and getting some good hits and and getting some good fielding and, and then just, uh, you know, hanging out at home with, with my three and a half year old, he's just a joy to play with, and and he's taking a nap right now. So. <laughs> That's a good thing. So, Terry, you've also had time to reflect on the literally thousands and thousands of letters that you received and supporters. So, what are a couple of thoughts on that? Um, you know, just I wish I could respond to all of them and and uh, you know thank them. Uh, I mean, a lot of them, uh, all of them were just very touching and, uh, you know, great uh, provider of strength to me during, you know, especially the first month or two of incarceration, which was, you know, a big big letdown, a big change from, you know, being somebody that's uh, usually a, in leadership positions or supervisory positions, and all of a sudden you're a name and a number uh, being ordered around by a, by a private. It's a big change, but uh, those letters were very, very inspirational and, and uh, you know, uh, very uh, helped me out a lot. And of course, among the thousands of your letters, there's also a handful of people who have been ardent supporters of your action. One of them is Dr. Jerome Corsi, who is with us this afternoon. Welcome, Dr. Corsi. Uh, great to be with you. Thank you very much, Marco. Very good to have you with us. And uh, any thoughts for Terry before we get into your interview? I know you feel strongly about his actions. Well, I think it's actually the first time Terry and I have actually talked, isn't it, Terry? Well, yes, I believe we were on uh, maybe the G. Gordon Liddy show. Once on G. Gordon Liddy show, we very quickly, but it was hardly a chance to really spend any time together. Um, exactly. I've got to say I tremendously admire what you've done. 
and I think um, you're clearly an American hero to millions of people, myself included, and I just want to uh, commend you and tell you um, how sorry I am that you had to go through what you went through, the incarceration, separation from your family, and uh, my prayers are with you, and I think we'll do everything we can, I can, to support you. Will Net Daily is 100% behind you, and we hope we've uh, adequately promoted uh, your uh, foundation, your fundraising, your efforts, and we want to continue to do so. Well, thank you. I know you've been very busy on this issue, too, <laughs> to say the least. Well, I've been very busy on the issue, but I haven't had to pay the price you've paid. So, um, you know, that, that I think what's so terribly, you know, shocking to me is that um, this document, the song form birth certificate, which I'm confident is a forgery, and we will prove it's a forgery, um, you know, that Barack Obama would release it to attempt to prevent my book from being published, to save himself. Uh, but, you know, let's, if the document existed, and I quite frankly doubt that it did, uh, I don't think it was forged until relatively recently, but if the document existed, it's shocking that Barack Obama would not have released that document to uh, prevent you from having to go to prison, which shows how little Barack Obama cares about anybody but himself. Yes, and that's the course we want to get to. So, Terry, we're going to let you take a break. We're going to bring you back at the end to talk about a very exciting announcement about your story, right? So uh, we'll move on with Dr. Corsi. Terry, we'll get back with you, I guess, just about uh, 355 or so. So, right, Terry, for... if there's anything you need reported in World Net Daily, uh, you can contact me or Joseph Farrell. We always are open to you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Corsi, as everybody knows, I hardly need to do an introduction. You've been all over the news, and you've written this book, Where's the Birth Certificate? And for us, one of the – in and surrounding the release of the long form, the Democratic Governor Association published a letter that said, quote, it's a new low no matter how many times it's disproven, Republicans still embrace the dangerous conspiracy theory that President Obama wasn't born in this country and is not eligible to hold office. And our response was, um, it hasn't been proven, has it? And, of course, that's what your whole story is about, right? Well, that's right. I mean, the White House <clears throat> desperately wants this story to go away because the White House knows that if um, Americans <clears throat> read my book and understand that Obama is not eligible to be president, uh, the Obama administration had to try to prevent this book from being published because it can't survive, ultimately. The administration cannot survive understanding the lies that Obama has told about his nativity story, about his past, about how many documents he has withheld from the American public. So the American public really don't know very much about who uh, And he's largely an undocumented president that is hiding behind a compliant and uh, loving media that's acting more like a political media unwilling to do his job as the fourth estate. Uh, so... Obama has been able to game the system, and gaming the system, they're trying to do it again by suggesting anyone who would dare, to, you know, argue for, you know, for the need for forensic testing of the original birth certificate, still held in the vault at the Department of Health in Hawaii. Well, that's what any court would examine. That's what any court would demand. The best evidence of that document is not the electronic version the White House released on its website or the Xerox that the White House distributed to the uh, press in the room, it's the document itself, and that document remains hidden from view, not subject to forensic testing, and the cover-up goes on. And in an interesting contrast, as anyone who's watching the news, I guess apparently there were indictments against John Edwards yesterday for his certainly admittedly irresponsible behavior. Two years, they said they investigated every corner of his life and his campaign for what is clearly irresponsible uh, behavior, and then you look at the preponderance of evidence outlined in your book, which we'll get to in the next segment. I wonder why isn't anyone stepping up to the plate on this? Well, so why isn't anyone stepping up to the plate? And also, Marco, look, the mainstream media didn't do its job on John Edwards either. The mainstream media was equally in, in love with every Democratic candidate, it seems. Certainly, Edwards got a pass from the mainstream media with National Enquirer that exposed John Edwards. Mainstream media is not doing its job, period. Mainstream media 
we've had a, a group of kids since the 60s educated in our colleges who are now in positions of responsibility, including in the mainstream media, who have been trained as socialists and communists. They're leftists. They believe it's their job to politically, as news people, to advance a political agenda. They're partisans. They might as well be called Pravda. I'm an old-style journalist, and the way journalism was created under the First Amendment, and uh, I was taught it by my father, and I'm sure his father before him, and the tradition is that journalists are hard-hitting, looking for the facts, and investigating everybody, Republicans and Democrats alike. Uh, and that tradition of you know, inquisitive, not believing, uh, journalism is gone in the mainstream media. That's why the mainstream media is dying. Interesting. And, of course, yeah, well, hopefully somebody will come around. So let's take a look before we go to our break. Uh, what do you think, well, or my question really is, right now, before we get into the book itself, tell us clearly why every citizen of this country should be dead serious about this issue. Well, I mean, first of all, it's a constitutional issue. The Constitution requires that the president be a natural-born citizen, not just a citizen, but a subset of citizens. That's a natural-born citizen because our founding for, uh, our forefathers did not want a person of divided citizenship loyalty to be in the presidency. And as long as that's a part of the Constitution, we've got an obligation to make sure it's adhered to, and not just politically adhered to. The Democrats attacked McCain viciously on his. Uh, citizenship requirements, having been born in the Panama Canal Zone, where his father was serving in the military. But they wanted to pass on Obama because they knew Obama was a dual citizen from birth with his father having been born in Kenya. Did not have two U.S. citizen parents, as the resolution for John McCain specified you had to have to be a natural-born citizen. Uh, secondly, now that this long-form birth certificate has been released, a crime has been committed. This is a criminal forgery, and as such a crime, a cancer is on the presidency, as John Dean said, having committed crimes by Barack Obama. He's now in the chain of evidence, having come to the White House press room and said, this is my birth certificate. Barack Obama owns that document, and the future of the Obama administration depends on that document being authentic. When it's proven to be a criminal fraud, it's going to be hard to see how Barack Obama will be allowed to remain in office. Very interesting. Well, we're going to jump to our break, and when we come back, we're going to dive into some of the content of your book. So everyone, hang on to your seats, and we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Back to America's Web Radio. Good afternoon. Welcome back, Dr. Corsi. Uh, thanks, Marco. So this book, which which had actually, I, I pre-ordered one. I got one the day after it came out with your signature in it. I was very excited to get this. It came out um there was this huge flap about it, as many people know. Uh, what, what's been the response so far to the book in general? I'm sure you've gotten swamped. Well, I, I think you can take a look at um, Amazon.com. The reviews that are positive are in the preponderance. You know, the, and they're very detailed and very um, analytic, uh, whereas the, the left, when they're attacking the book, are just call me names. I mean, they're sophomoric. They're, you know, fairly moronic. I mean, they're just foaming at the mouth. Saul Walensky, call it, you know, ridicule-type um, drivel. People haven't even read the book who oppose it from the left. So, I mean, you know, I think this is typical. The, the arguments made in the book uh, are well documented. There's 125 documents. The book is, is tightly written so as to... Um, argue its points carefully, and uh, the left has not been able to respond to this. Now, the, the book is also very damaging in that it argues several different bases on which Obama is not eligible to be president. Um, not, he's a dual citizen at birth from his father. He, uh, his citizenship status was, I'm sure, compromised in Indonesia when he was adopted and became an Indonesian citizen. He used the name Barry Satoro. Uh, was identified by his mother with the, with the Indonesian surname Soy Barka. Um, I think it's very clear that the book is about who Obama really is. We, he's told so many lies about his, what I'm calling his nativity story, and his life, including his parents and their relationship, uh, that it's hard to know, you know what Barack Obama said about his life that's true. We don't have the documents. We don't have his 
any of his um, passport records. We don't have travel records, school records. I mean, was he a foreign student when he applied to college or these various schools? Did he get foreign student aid? How did he get into these schools? He was a self-admitted drug addict when he was in, at Occidental, smoking marijuana and doing cocaine. Yet he gets into Columbia. Well, who recommended him? Who paid? These are law, it's law records. We don't know how he billed the hours. You want to know what he did as a state senator? Barack Obama says he lost his calendar. They didn't keep a calendar for him. This is a nowhere man. This is a guy who is undocumented, an undocumented worker in the White House. That's how Obama wants it, because then he can hide behind his uh, misinformation, um, lies about himself, told through dreams from my father. And if the American people give him a pass, Barack Obama, now we know, will even produce fraudulent documents to secure his power in the White House. That birth certificate is an obvious fraud, and we're well intent on proving it. So I think the book has had an enormous impact and will continue to have an enormous impact, despite all odds, despite, you know, the Barack Obama people asking for the book to be withdrawn. They said, where's the birth certificate? It's the title of the book. Birth certificate's right here on the White House website. And so here I am even on, on Fox Business News with Greg Jarrett, saying it's a forgery, and Greg Jarrett's acting, you know, high and mighty on his judgmental horse here saying, how dare you write a book like this? And I'm saying, when I just went through a time warp and I ended up in MSNBC, and you know, Greg Jarrett's saying, we just wrote this book to make money. I'm saying, wait a minute, I thought this was Fox Business. Did we lapse into socialism somewhere here where it's wrong to write a book for money? So, you know, the, the argument this book, has raised and continues to raise is one that is at the heart of our freedoms. How can a president who will not even come forward and willingly prove his eligibility to be president take an oath to preserve and protect and defend the document that he doesn't have the authority or he doesn't have the grace or the, the willingness to comply with and its fundamental demand that he shows he's eligible to hold that office? And of course, that is an interesting issue, isn't it? We should not be spending thousands of hours and thousands and millions of dollars doing this. It should be easy to prove. Yeah. Uh, we we get letters saying, "Well, Terry didn't ask for Bill Clinton's, you know, uh, vitals or George Bush's vitals," and our response is, "Well, we never had a president before that we doubted, and who didn't have people he knew, who people weren't at his wedding, didn't vacation with him, who didn't have pictures and videos and movies, and you know." Well, Michael. Let me just read you a minute. Here's the first beginning of the book, and I, I spent a lot of time making sure readers understood this, that the initial attack was on John McCain. Of course, then they didn't call themselves racist or any or birthers or anything else. Wall Street Journal, does John McCain have a birthplace problem? February 28, 2008, MSNBC, McCain citizenship called into question. February 28, 2008, Washington Post, McCain's birth abroad stirs legal debate, May 2nd, 2008. They went on and on and on attacking McCain and, you know, thought it was fully legitimate from the left, the Democrats, uh, because McCain was born in the Canal Zone. Now, McCain submitted to Congress. He showed his birth credentials, and, and Senate Resolution 511 judged that McCain was a natural-born citizen. He had two U.S. citizen parents when he was born, a primary requirement, and that he'd be born a natural, you know, on U.S. soil, uh, the Congress said, well, the founders never meant to exclude someone as natural-born citizen running for president because he was born outside the country to parents who were serving in the military defending the nation. Now, Barack Obama refused to submit his birth credentials to Congress because Barack Obama co-sponsored that resolution, a typically dishonest act from Obama, but refused to submit his own birth credentials because Obama knew that he did not have two U.S. citizen parents when he was born. His father was born in Kenya, was a Kenyan citizen throughout his life. Obama was a dual citizen of the Commonwealth of Great Britain through his father. Uh, Kenya was a Commonwealth country. And dual citizens are, by definition, not natural-born citizens. I found the last thing our founders wanted was somebody who had citizenship allegiance to Great Britain to end up as president. Yeah, I would guess not. Particularly how our country emerged. Having so, fought a revolutionary war against 
Great Britain, the founders did not want a back door to head of state to someone who at one time was a British citizen in any capacity, became an American citizen, and then became president. That's what they that was clearly something they wanted to prevent. So you this book got a huge amount of press and then of course as we know and you led off this segment by talking about the fact that uh, they said, Oh, the birth certificate's right here on the site. What what do you think about the timing of that? I mean it was interesting for us on on Terry Lakin's side, that that thing just appeared almost like, oh, my dog found it under the bed. It was like so casual after being told for months that there was no other documentation, right? And they even had the state of Hawaii twisting Hawaiian law and say that Obama couldn't have one of these long form birth certificates if he wanted it. Look, I've, we had been tipped off in February uh, that one of, my, one of my top intelligence sources in Hawaii, you know, I spent a lot of time in Hawaii, um, it called and said that the a mole that we've had inside the Department of Health reported that the document was now forged and it was in the log book and had been seen and it included Kapilani Hospital. Uh, the, the person who looked at it didn't was too scared to take a picture of it and didn't remember the doctor's name. I wrote up an article for February 24th for World Net Daily. Joseph Ferrer didn't want to publish it because I didn't have two sources, but I fully memorialized. But I've been told a forged document now existed. Uh, I did not want to change the name of the book. You know, sure, we'd suffer a, a, a marketing setback in terms of public relations when the White House could say, ha, 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 it's still here. You know, Bill Mayer could make a joke of it in, on TV. But who cares? I mean, I achieved what I wanted to achieve. I thought if we could only keep the title this way, tempt the White House to think they could kill the book, we might actually get the White House to commit a crime, namely to release that long-form birth certificate. And I said it's worth the marketing setback to get the White House to commit a crime. Because once Barack Obama comes forward, which he did, he came forward in the White House press room, he had memorialized in White House documents that he sent his lawyers to pick this document up in Hawaii, a long-form birth certificate. He said, this is my birth certificate. Barack Obama is now in the chain of evidence. Before, when it was just the short form, Barack Obama could say, well, fact check and daily cause and my supporters put that together. It wasn't me. But now he owns this document. And secondly, the White House owns this exact document. They can't say, oh, wait a minute, that's not the birth certificate we meant. Or, oh, wait a minute, yeah, we did forge that, but the information's correct. No, the White House said, this is the birth certificate. If that document is forged, then the White House owns a criminal forgery. And I, I said, we may suffer a temporary marketing setback, but forever now the White House is stuck with this document, and the future of the Obama administration depends on that document being authentic. The moment we prove to the American people it's a fake, the Obama presidency falls. And, of course, there is one. That's exactly where I wanted them. And there's one huge anomaly here, which is that no one's actually seen the birth certificate, correct? Right. It's still under lock and key in Hawaii. And as I say, a court would demand best evidence, and the best evidence is the document itself. And a court would demand that Hawaii produce that document and submit it to forensic testing. And the curious, is not going to do. And the curious part is we're not asking for some obscure document or reams and reams and reams of paper asking for a single sheet of paper that every person born in this country has. Also it's not hard. Demand, a court would demand corroborating evidence. In other words, okay, Kapiolani, you're listed as a hospital. Where's Ann Dunham, the mother's patient records? They don't have them. I've known since 2008 there are quarterly meetings in Hawaii, the hospital administrators. They've been looking for Obama's birth documents since 2008, and nobody can find them. They don't exist. Uh, and it's the same with Dr. Sinclair. Dr. Sinclair is, you know, if he's the attending physician, where are his records? I'd like to see his, I'd like to see Ann Dunham's patient records in Dr. Sinclair's files. They don't exist. Pretty extraordinary. Well, hold your thought on that. We're going to go to our second break here in just a second. We get back. Let's pick that up, talk a little bit about the content of the book. So I'm going to turn it back to America's Web Radio. Welcome back, Dr. Corsi. 
So we got through a bunch of material in the first two segments. Let's take a quick look. Uh, in your book, you've broken it out uh, quite clearly. You start off with a preface, ineligible for command, then undocumented worker, and and then the most of the first part we've already covered. Let's go to the cracks in the Obama nativity story because I read this on the plane flying out to Kansas to help to bring Terry back after his release, and I just felt like I was reading a really, really bad spy novel. Uh, <laughs> Walk us through this. How how can this be? Like, is this Tom Clancy's next book or something? You know, well, uh, people say the book reads like a page turner, and I guess it it really does. Um, look, here's the here's the deal. The um, you've got a situation where um, Barack Obama's lied about the fundamentals of his nativity story. He says, "Let's start here." He says, "Barack Obama says in dreams from my father." But his mother and father lived as a happy couple after he was born until the father, Barack Obama Sr., had to go to Harvard for graduate studies, and that's when the family broke up. It isn't true. Within three weeks, Ann Dunham, the mother, picks up and takes the baby with her, an infant child, to Seattle in Washington State, where she enrolls in classes at the University of Washington and Seattle. I've got all the proof of that. I think nine pages of the 125 documents, nine pages of them are about Ann Dunham going to the University of Washington and Seattle. I've got a transcript. You can see when she enrolled the courses, the grades she got. I've got the course catalog. So you can see they were night classes. I've even got a picture of the house where she had an apartment, and I talked to the babysitter. Ann Dunham, and, and you have to imagine, here's a, a less than two-month-old baby and for anybody who's had a, a, a child, a two-month-old baby is a handful. It's a full-time job to maintain that baby. Uh, without her mother, at 18 years old, is leaving Honolulu and going to Seattle, establishing her own apartment, going to, to take night class. That's extraordinary. Certainly not the happy family scenario that Barack Obama presents in Dreams of My Father. In fact... When you dig into it, it's not clear mommy and daddy were even married. There's no marriage certificate. Uh, more missing documents. Uh, they don't live together. Barack Obama Sr. The, always has an apartment by the university. Ann Dunham uh, was with her parents. The birth announcement in the newspaper was the grandparents' address. Hawaii law allowed the grandparents to register a baby's birth, even if the baby was born in a foreign country. Because the Department of Hawaii at that time had, and still today has no investigative unit, and they accept the testimony of the family as proof of an Hawaiian birth. Now, when you look at the whole story, it's pretty clear to me that, and uh, you know, from some of the additional research we've done, now we have Barack Obama Sr.'s immigration file, which I didn't have when I wrote the book, and it's clear that even the Immigration Naturalization Service doubted very strongly that Barack Obama and Ann Dunham were married. There's papers in the file that they couldn't find the marriage certificate either. Uh, if, if Barack Obama Sr. Um, was obviously doing a sham marriage, you know, which is typical of the time and today. A foreigner picks a U.S. citizen wife, and they have a child, a U.S. citizen child, and now they've got a wife and child as a anchor to stay in the United States. Well, the Immigration Naturalization Service had uh, a one very scathing call that was made into the file uh, from one of the agents who determined that Barack Obama was still in this bachelor apartment living like a playboy, a lot of girlfriends, not if, not indicating he was married to anybody. And you know, I've got articles from the newspaper Barack Obama Sr. was interviewed throughout this time. He was well-known, the first African to attend the University of Hawaii. He never mentions that he has a Hawaiian wife and a son. I mean, any reporter, this would be the story. Um, a student comes from Africa first to attend the university, you know, finds local girl, gets married, and has baby. Well, that story is nowhere to be found because they weren't, and even Ed, Governor Abercrombie comes around and says, well, he visited the family and the child when they were there. Nonsense, a lie. They weren't a family together. And, in fact, I think, you know, I've also released now the documents that the government of Kenya 
has concluded they believe that Obama was born there. They believed Grandma Sarah when she said she was present at Obama's birth in Mombasa. And the government of Kenya told the Bush administration on government stationery, they wrote a letter to Ambassador Rannenberger in Nairobi, and they said Obama's birth records, which they believed were there, were criminally destroyed. Had a pattern of about 40 birth certificates around them were altered in order to hide the fact that Obama's birth certificate had been removed. That's what the government of Kenya believes. Who, who would have done that? Someone in the Kenyan government? Well, certainly when Obama was over in 2006 on a state visit, he spent a lot of time with Raila Odinga, and as I pointed out, even helped fund Odinga's campaign, which probably was illegal. But I'm sure there was plenty of opportunity to arrange for altering of the birth records at that time. Now, the question that... Whoever did them, that's speculation on my part, whoever did them, all I know is a fact, all I can report is a fact, is the government of Kenya believes that Obama's birth records were criminally destroyed and removed from the file. Yes, and then you have the strange case of the Obama mama. So give us a little background on that. Because that comes up all the time, but I don't think people really understand what it is. Ann Dunham uh, had, was, you know, had this missing period of time in her life. There were six months where nobody knows where Ann Dunham was, and it was when she was pregnant. And, I mean, I think the full story, as I'm getting it, I just was in Hawaii before the book was printed, and I think the full story, I just got some pieces of it. Ann Dunham was spending a lot of time around one particular bar, uh, Bill Letterer's bar, in uh, Two Hotel Street, in the not-too-nice district of Hawaii. Bill Letterer was, by the way, the guy who wrote The Ugly American, wrote a couple of very famous books in the 50s, and he had a bar in Hawaii. The story is that she got pregnant, and that she wanted Obama Sr. to be the father. I'm pretty sure she did. And my guess is, I've got an is that Ann Dunham probably on her own went to Hawaii. It went from Hawaii to Kenya to try to convince the family that she should be, you know, I think Ann Dunham had in her mind this Eva Perone complex. She was going to be the Eva Perone of Kenya. She was going to be um, married to the guy who was going to be educated and go back and run the country, and they were going to save it with their great, great economic knowledge, and she would be the Mrs. Obama in Kenya. Number two. Well, except that Barack Obama Sr. wasn't very interested. And I think when Ann Dunham got to Nairobi, the grandmother did make sure she got her baby delivered in Mombosa. Mombosa. The intelligence reports I have from Kenya say the baby was delivered at the Lady Grig wing of the Mombasa General Hospital. And um, she probably came back with the baby and found out Barack Obama Sr. was still not interested in her, and I think that's why she left so quickly with the baby and went to Seattle. She didn't want to be around Honolulu, which is a pretty small place, saying that this guy was the father and he didn't want to live with her. Interesting. Wow. So, so the, key, the key element of this is not only that Obama's lied about all this, maintained mommy and daddy lived together. He's told that story even after I put into print the documents that proved that Ann Dunham was at the University of Washington in Seattle. The story was bunk. And if he's born in Hawaii, in Hawaii which is what, this, what, what the story I just told, which I think is the truth, that Obama was born in Kenya, means that of necessity it is a lie that Obama was born in Hawaii, and that birth certificate the White House released is a fraudulent document. Interesting. Well, you know, when you put this all together, sometimes you feel like you're living a continuous kind of um, a combination of the X-Files and 24 all, you know, crammed into one crazy event. Because in your next section, you start off with stonewalling in Hawaii. And people have actually asked us this, how could this be? How many people would it take to sustain this? So, I mean, what do you think about that? This is the question comes up all the time. Oh, come on, this, this couldn't continue. This can't be possibly be true. But it is. In Hawaii, there's a strong motivation to want this Obama to be president. First of all, Hawaii is, is about as leftist a state as we have. Obama, they'd like to have someone from Hawaii be president. So there's a tremendous reluctance on the part of the Hawaii Department of Health. And Hawaii, let's face it, has been lax on their birth 
certificate processes from when it was, Hawaii was a territory. It's been the, I show in the book on page 35, Hawaii gave the Chinese nationalist Sun Yat-sen a certificate. Sun Yat-sen was obviously born in China. He was a very famous figure uh, through World War II in China. But on page 36, I got this out of the Smithsonian. This is all out of the Library of Congress and uh, fully documented. Uh, Hawaii let some people give affidavits in, in 1904 that Sun Yat-sen, that they were there when Sun Yat-sen was born. That was good enough to give Sun Yat-sen a birth certificate. Hawaii would give anybody a birth certificate if the family walked in and said, here's my electric bills, we live here, and this child is born to the family. They didn't even have to have the mother come in or the child come in or the father come in, grandparents could have come in. That would have been enough to create a Hawaiian birth even if the child had been born in Kenya. I'm not even sure August 4th is the birth date. That may be the date when mommy was coming back from Kenya and they decided we better get in and register this baby as a U.S. citizen because he's going to be here pretty soon. They didn't register him as a U.S. citizen because they thought he was going to be president. There's intrinsic advantages to being a U.S. citizen. Like said, this baby is qualified to go to public school. This baby can get a driver's license when he's old enough, can get a uh, Social Security card, can get a passport. And by the way, if the baby's a U.S. citizen, we don't have to go register the baby with the Immigration Naturalization Service and worry about, um, you know, the, the, the privileges, the visa privileges for the child to remain in Hawaii. So clearly the family wanted this baby registered as a U.S. citizen, a Hawaii resident. And the Hawaii Department of Health has been covering up ever since, because they don't want to have to admit to the world how sloppy their procedures are to register birth. And the question, though, is we have a lot of smart people in government, and we've, I think uh, the Brain Reboot guys did a cartoon a couple weeks, but that Apple iPad thing came out. Like, in less than five days, they were clamoring for congressional hearings over privacy uh, because of the iPhone location, and we did a little cartoon that they put out that they said, you know, how, timeline to court martial, five days you know, timeline to eligibility of research, two and a half years, nothing, right? Well, see, look, there's a lot of people in Hawaii who know the truth. I've talked to many people in Hawaii who know the truth. I've talked to people who knew the Dunham, you know, Ann Dunham and her family when this was going on. I've talked to people who knew Bill Letterer's bar and were there with Ann Dunham. I've talked to police who know all about it. Nothing went on in Hotel Street in Hawaii that the police didn't know fully about. Nothing went on in that island that there wasn't somebody who observed. Now, the people don't want us to come out and talk the truth about it or to come out and speak about it. I mean, it's like, you know, Barack Obama. Yeah, I've talked to people who said Barack Obama, when he went to Puna, who was a total pothead, just like he says. And he wasn't called Obama from the, ba from the basketball team because he took long shots. called Obama from the basketball team because he was always bombed. He never knew what he was going to do. My point is, there are people who know, and there's people in Washington who know, there's people in the administration who know that this is a forged document. And sooner or later, those people will turn on Obama. And this story will not stay hidden forever. And that's what we want to touch on, right, when we come back. So let's go back to America's Web Radio for our last break. and come back with Dr. Corsi and close out with Dr. Corsi and Terry. So stay tuned. So, Dr. Corsi, at the end of the last segment, you were saying, you know, there's lots of people who know the truth about all of these issues, and it's not just the birth certificate. It's all the facts. And so we get down to the really big question is, why is it taking so long for people to act? Who should be acting? And what would happen if this actually, or when it does actually come to a head here, and, and actually we have to make a decision about what to do? Well, this thing is moving. The whole investigation about Barack Obama and the whole issue is the birth certificates moving much faster than people know. I mean, you could say, well, it's not on the mainstream media yet. It's not being discussed, so it's dead. Well, that's hardly the case. It's, uh, I remind people, Watergate burglary took place in, 1960, in 1972, I think in June. After that, Obama, I'm sorry, Nixon won a landslide victory against McGovern. He won every state in the presidential election except for Massachusetts. It wasn't until August 1974 that Nixon resigned. Take some time, and there's periods where what's going on is going on below the surface. 
but millions of people are catching on. The articles who are writing in World Net Daily, there's one today with Doug Voigt, who's a scanner expert who's produced excellent forensic evidence, filed a criminal complaint with the FBI. He needs to be removed from office for producing a forgery. Clearly, the FBI is going to be very reluctant, especially with Eric Holder, to do an investigation. But as the groundswell builds, as the evidence built, we've got additional evidence that will be coming out in WorldNet Daily. There is compelling evidence that this document is a forgery. And uh, it, it, the forensic evidence that Doug Boyd has produced is just the beginning. All people have to do is take a look at that number 10641 in the upper right-hand corner of the document, exp you know, magnify that to about 500%, and clearly the one the last one is a different quality. It was a JPEG. The rest are bitmap. The other numbers look alike. The one looks totally different. It was cut and pasted into that number. The pixels around it show whoever did that in Adobe didn't even know. They weren't very expert. They couldn't repair the pixels to make it look less like it had been dropped in. There's a cut and paste job. And when the American people realize it, and I assure you, this is known at the White House. I, mean, I know this for a fact, that the White House is fully aware that the vulnerability that can remove Obama from office is the birth certificate. And they now appreciate that, you know, I did jam them with the book. We did the strategy work, and they did blink, get fearful, and release a fraudulent document they thought they could get away with. I don't think the everybody in the White House knew. I think um, the attorney... Robert Bauer quit when he realized that he, too, had been lied to. His John Dean moment. John Dean in the White House under Nixon had the same cold one night, middle of the night, you know, cold sweat recognition that he'd been taken. And on his belief that Nixon was telling the truth, he'd been step by step in increasingly committing felonies himself, for which John Dean lost his law license for the rest of his life. And um, this is happening today in the White House. The White House is already preparing. There's already work going on in the White House and discussions going on in the Democratic Party as to how they're going to tell Obama he's not going to be their next candidate. I think it's 50-50 to me. It's, it's every day the odds are turning against Obama that he will be allowed to run for re-election in the Democratic Party. I don't think he's going to survive politically the fallout of an increasing number of Americans recognizing that this is a forgery. Um, we may have a, a political mainstream media, but you know, hopefully this could lead to a great sweeping out of the media, too, and get rid of all these political hacks that think they're journalists. And that would go through all the major news and um, print and television media, especially, at the mainstream level. If, if they don't get rid of it, they don't clean house after this scandal becomes where nobody will ever watch ABC, NBC, or CBS again. And the, you know, even if you had, there'd be no reason to buy the Wall Street Journal or the, you know, New York Times or the Washington Post again. Where people have such little trust in their ability to report news after this story is fully known. I think it's that magnitude. Uh, people need to be patient to follow the story. There are going to be sites developing for petitions for impeachment, petitions for um, criminal action, investigation to be taken. I think we'll see demonstrations. I think through the summer, this is going to get um, very ugly. And I think I gave it from the beginning. I said two months from the time my book is published until a critical mass in America begins to realize again that this birth certificate document can no longer be supported. When that happens, I think it's going to be very difficult for the Obama administration to remain in office. And what do you think the results of that will be? I mean, Alan Keyes discussed this with us at one point. It's it's an interesting issue for the nation, but we, we can handle it. It's a constitutional crisis. I don't know what would happen. Conceivably, all the actions that Obama has voted in would be null and void. Uh, I think what we I think the American people, you know, like differ from Jack Nicholson in that movie. I think America, America can handle the truth. I think what America can't handle is allowing a liar to remain in office without um, it violating the Constitution. If we allow that to happen, we've lost our republic. 
And that, of course, is the great concern. So let's bring Terry back on. Terry, are you there? He should be back in a second. Well, yeah, Marco. Well, there we go. I want to say also Terry to be, again, commended because without his courage having, you know, putting virtually everything on the line, he would not have focused to the American people how callous Obama was, that Obama would not release this long-form birth certificate uh, during Lieutenant Colonel Lakin's prosecution, but yet to save Obama's own hide and try to prevent a book from being published, Obama just rushed forward and mockingly released the document in the White House press room that somehow wasn't available just a few weeks later when Lieutenant Colonel Lakin was uh, being prosecuted. And so, Terry, we have had an offer from a nationally known author who we'll name in a few weeks to write your story, correct? Oh, yes, we have. Um, I'm very excited about it. Um, you know, doing interviews and, uh, you know, typing away as, as fast as I can, too. It's a, a very exciting process. And I believe that the book is also going to include some short essays of key people who have been involved with you and the movement, correct? Yes, it will. And There's a number of people that uh, will have, uh, you know, some short stories done on them, and, and I, you know, really look forward to seeing those. those I think be a great addition to the book. And we've invited some authors to write some essays on the concept of oaths and commitment and principle, which will be exciting as well. Plus, I think we're going to have the art of uh, your case as well, correct? There's been some very funny things done uh, to communicate your message, including the cartoon that came out today from brainreboot.com, probably the best eligibility cartoon ever. So it should be an exciting book, don't you think? I'm looking forward to it. I'm I'm excited about it. I, you know, this this day and age of electronic media, you know, I listening to Dr. Corsi there, and and you know, it's distressing how some of the media can you know change their stories. And you know, I was look, looking through his book again, looking at UPI and and other uh, uh, websites that have a story, and then they'll change the birthplace scenario, and, uh, you know, it's reminiscent of the 1984 book by Orwell, the, with the uh, changing of the stories. And, and Dr. Corsi, what do you think people, why do you think people need to hear Terry's story when it comes out in book form? Well, because Terry Lincoln's a hero, and I think the story needs to be told, and, you know, not only this generation, but future generations understand that Americans still value the Constitution and the liberties our founding fathers gave us and all the men and women who have fought and died and just just go to Arlington Cemetery. Those people did not fight and die for a, a liar to be in the White House who will not even prove his eligibility when do a fraudulent document to stay in power. We need for the purity and for the preservation of our republic to make sure the Constitution is preserved and protected and defended by the people if it is not preserved and protected by the so-called president. And, you know, it's interesting. We went to the museum a few weeks ago, and they have a display called the Documents of Freedom, and it shows uh, almost, I guess, seven or 800 years of literature that led up to our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence. It wasn't accidental. It wasn't a bunch of guys getting together one night and saying, oh, let's write this thing. You know, this was serious long-term thought as we moved from monarchy to representative government. And it needs to be protected with the greatest, greatest amount of intellectual energy. And our founding fathers believed that this was ordained by God and by natural right. In other words, that what they were putting together as a structure of government was a structure of government that was necessitated by our human nature to be, you know, one of the only forms that would preserve the liberties and the freedoms that were inalienable, God-given, and that's what it was all about. And it was a form of limited government, limited power, with checks and balances internal to it between judicial, executive, and legislative powers. It's a very carefully crafted document, and one that we can't tinker with uh, without grave consequences. It's, I think these are principles that uh, the vast majority of Americans would understand. The tragedy is that we're not teaching this enough in our schools. And we need also to root out this generation, not only from the White House that doesn't care about our constitutions, but we need to root them out 
from the media and from the educational system. Excellent. So, Terry, any closing words for Dr. Corsi? I know you really appreciate what he's done. I, I do. I'm, you know, thank you for for all your writings, and um, you know, I think this book is excellent. And Terry, you're welcome. I've done nothing compared to what you've done. You, uh, you've um, lost liberty. You've suffered interpersonally, and uh, I salute you. And we need to come to a close. Dr. Corsi, thank you so much for your time. I know you've done as many as 20 interviews a day, so we really appreciate your time. Terry, thanks for joining us. And for those of you that don't know the full story, please visit the short form of the website, terrylakin.com, L-A-K-I-N.com. Read Terry's story. Uh, he gave up his his pay, his pension, his career on behalf of our Constitution. And those of you who are concerned with that. He needs your support now until he gets back on his feet. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for a great a great hour. Look forward to talking to you again. Uh, thank you, Marco. Anytime. Thank you for listening to this show recorded on June 6, 2011, as an interview between Terry Lakin, Marco Cellino, and Dr. Jerome Corsi. Please listen to the show, then visit terrylakin.com and consider supporting Terry for the sacrifice he's made on behalf of the nation. The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide.